It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It's the Jill on Money Show, and we are here answering your financial questions. If you've got one, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com, and click on the Contact Us button. You write your note out, and if you'd like to join us on the air live, just check that box, and Mark does everything else because he's the best executive producer in the whole wide world. Now, while you're on the website, you can do lots of things for free. You can check out our two podcasts. You can read the blog. You can check out my recent appearances on CBS Network. You can check out the resources section, and you can also sign up for the free weekly newsletter. So I encourage everyone to do just that. Let's start the show with an email from Susan. She says, I recently found your podcast. I've been working backwards through the episodes. Excellent, because they sell ads against those back episodes, Mark. I don't know if you know that. She's listening to episodes from May of 22, and she's learning so much. That's so nice. She says, I am feeling okay about our retirement plan, except for the long-term care component. I feel like we probably need long-term care insurance, but we've heard so many horror stories about non-payment by the insurance companies or large annual rate hikes. So we're afraid to purchase it. Are we making a mistake? Let's see what they got here. Susan is 60. Her husband's 66. He makes $215 plus an $85,000 bonus. So he's three hundred. dollars presuming he gets the bonus. She is not working. Three kids launched, no college debt. They went to state school. How about that, Mark? Husband's got a million and a half dollars in a 401k, 14 grand in a Roth. She's got 80 grand in an IRA. Most so all, basically I would say most of their money pre-tax. Brokerage account, $325,000, short-term bond funds, some stock funds. High yield savings account, 60. CD ladder, 125, $125,000. Checking, 25. I bonds, 41. House is paid off, worth about 800 grand. Husband plans to work full time two more years, then work part time, $75,000 a year until at least 70, probably longer. He likes the challenge of work. She likes volunteering, reading, socializing. They like hiking and traveling. Social Security, 4600 a month for him. For her, half of his um, would be about 1800 Current expenses, 5500 Can we just use the equity in, house, in the house for a long-term care? Apartment life is fine with me. I don't mind selling this big maintenance drag of a house. Hubby loves the house. Are we endangering our futures by not buying long-term care insurance? Don't care what we leave to the kids. We paid for college. Any inheritance is a bonus. I love these people. I mean, okay. If you wanted to, if you wanted to explore it, I guess that one might say, instead of using the money to pay for long-term care insurance, I would probably still build up that brokerage account. I probably would stop with a 401k. I think I would probably at 300 grand in um, salary, I might, you know, put in up to a match or something, but I'd start continue. I'd, I would like you guys, by the time he really stops working, it'd be nice for you to have more like half a million dollars that is sitting in a pretty boring brokerage account. You've got 325 now. I think you can get a half a million. I think you're close. Look, there's something to be said for like, okay, you got a million and a half, one, two, 1.6 million in retirement assets, 323, four, more than 500 grand in like mostly accessible. I think it would be nice to have like by the time he stops working, having the money that's in the retirement account is great, but then building up the other stuff. Uh, and especially when he is looking at the the prospect of continuing to work. I mean, when you'll be in a lower tax bracket, I would just be very happy to have all that money start to come in, tax at a lower level. I mean, the problem with long-term care insurance, it's not like you're endangering your future. You're willing to sell an asset. The question is, that, you know, would you really be able to do it? You know, you probably would if you had to, but I don't think you're going to have to. If you wanted to get some coverage, it would be partial coverage at the very, but that's it. Nothing more than that. 
All right, Mark, this is a tough one. Here is the question. Subject. Did I make a huge mistake? Uh Uh-oh. Hi, Jill. This is from Rob. Rob's 64, his wife's 61. He says he's retired. His wife works full-time, 50 grand a year. He said, I got involved with a mass mutual retirees annuity from Fidelity for $600,000 till surrender with $400,000 remaining in my Fidelity account, 250 grand in Charles Schwab. It's a fixed annuity. Okay. By the way, Fidelity has been big on these lately. I noticed that a lot of their people are selling these, which is not to say it's a bad thing because they're fixed annuities. They're not usually, they're not the big, huge larded up expensive ones. They, there's much simpler. It's a much simpler product. Okay. So here it is. We just started receiving $2,800 a month with taxes taken out per check, which falls short of what we need. We probably need $5,000 a month to cover things like larger expenses. Oy, okay, so let's just think about that, Mark. So they're getting $2,800. They have six fifty dollars left total, and they need out of that six fifty dollars to get to $5,000 a month. So his wife still works full-time, which is good. But if he has $2,800, 38. He's going to be short. He's probably short by another, I would say $1,000 a month because we have not taken taxes out when we start talking about the Fidelity and Charles Schwab accounts, right? They have no mortgage. They have no credit card expenses. This is the part that's a little bit weird. Over the years, I've had good communication with my Fidelity fiduciary. After I signed the contract, I asked him questions. He went cold, telling me not to worry that he was a fiduciary. Did I make the right choice? I still have other questions to ask or Mass Mutual about things I didn't see in the contract. No one is eager to talk to me. Like, what's the annual interest rate? That's that's knowable. Can I take out 10% without penalty if I needed to? Usually you can, but you should ask. These are all real questions. At the 10-year surrender period, can I take out my principal and interest with no penalty? There's no, after a surrender period, there's no penalty, but you have tax, you'll have a tax implication, okay? How can I be assured that my beneficiaries will receive my money and any money when I die. I don't think you get that. That's the downside with these things. The money is now gone. And I don't know, unless you have a named beneficiary, a survivor benefit, then you probably are not going to have that. It's not right. The fidelity guy is not answering your questions and he's being charged a management fee, but you shouldn't be getting charged a management fee on the annuity. They usually take that outside of the fee. Here's the thing. Don't have anxiety and and sleepless nights over this. There's two things you should do. You should call Fidelity and ask for this guy's manager. You should write a letter and make a formal complaint to the person. You got to find out who the manager is. Go and ask the boss. And you don't have to go to Mass Mutual. You have to deal with Fidelity. They sold it to you. So I'm sure they'll talk to you. I don't know why this guy is like, you know, icing you out. I will say, though, that with the annuity, without the annuity, either way, Based on the numbers he gave us, he's still short on $5,000 a month. But I, I, he, he didn't mention anything about Social Security, so I, I don't know. Yeah, so we're hoping that you get Social Security and, of course, that your wife continues to work. So there's that, too. The Jill and Money Show will be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here trying to help you make better financial decisions. If you need a little bit of assistance, maybe you need a nudge, maybe you need a a little kick in the tush, whatever it is, we'd love to help you out. All you need to do is go to jillonmoney.com and click the Contact Us button. If you want to join us on the air, don't forget to check off that little box. Right now, let's talk to Lisa from New Jersey. What's going on? What can we do for you, Lisa? So my husband and I both work full time. We're maxing out our retirement corporate match. We have two kids, um, four and one. So they're young. 
And we're looking to have another probably in the next one to two years. And I really wanted to get a sense from you, you know, what we should be focusing on going forward. What's the best strategy to build wealth for our family? You know, we're kind of in the phase where we have young kids and it costs money to have childcare and whatnot. So wanted to get your thoughts on, on next steps. Okay. Sounds good. So do you want to deal with you and your husband's earnings separately or do we should we pile them together? What's, what's easier for you to talk about this? I think combined makes most sense. Okay. So how much do you guys earn combined? About $390,000 a year pre-tax. 390000 Great. And you're both, um, how old? We are going to be 35 in a couple weeks. Oh, great. Congratulations. And you're both maxing out retirement accounts, meaning 22.5 each? By maxing out, I mean with our corporate match, so with the 401k, but then also I have a Roth and a rollover IRA separately. Okay, so you're just putting up to your matching level, which is what, 6%-ish? About that, yeah. And then for my Roth, um, I am maxing that out, but my husband doesn't have one. I do not have a Roth option at work. You know, I'm not sh- sure that we do. I would check that. I'm guessing that only because you told me where you work and now I know that. So I think you might. But I guess the other part of it is how are you make? are you doing a backdoor Roth? Is that how you're making these contributions? Um, no, I'm not. But I actually do have questions about that. I feel like you've talked about it probably on one of your past episodes and um, it's not something that I feel like I want to spend a lot of time on. I'd love to automate <laughs> anything and anything, anything and everything in my life. So just make it go away. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, the reason I'm asking this, Lisa, is that um, I'm pulling out my little chart from Ed Slot and Company's Roth IRA phase out limit. And for 2023, if you're married filing jointly and you make more than $228,000 together, you cannot make a Roth contribution. I think it's to um, to the IRA. Okay, then that's different. Okay, yeah. so you've got three different accounts. One is your four hundred one k. How much is in your four hundred one k right now? About fifty five thousand. Okay, and that's a pre tax four hundred one k. What company is it held at? Is it like Fidelity? Is it like Vanguard. a big company? It's Vanguard. Okay, then you also have a rollover IRA, right? Yes. So that one is about seventy six k. Mm-hmm. And my Roth has about 30K. Okay. And you're no longer putting money into your Roth because you would be precluded from doing that because- We there make are too con- much okay. money. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So why not, let, to simplify your life, why not take the rollover money that's in Vanguard and roll it into your current 401k? Is there some philosophical reason that you're not doing that? Uh, no, I could absolutely do that. Then you should absolutely do that. Because it's Vanguard to Vanguard, and you should stop putting money in your rollover IRA. Mark, I have a feeling, just I have a sneaky suspicion that maybe Lisa might have made a non-deductible IRA contribution. Do you suspect that also, Mark? Given the income limits, yeah, I I I don't see how it's not non-deductible. Do you work with a CPA? I don't. Mm, Who does the taxes, you or your husband? Oh, we farm it out. My uncle is a an accountant, so he helps us. <laughs> okay. All right. So one thing to ask your uncle is, did we take a deduction for these IRA contributions, Uncle Joe? That's why, you know, until you find that out, I don't think I would necessarily roll it into the workplace because some of that is pre-tax and some of that's non-deductible, it sounds like. Yeah. And I want to know how long you've been making those contributions into that rollover. It could be you're going to get screwed on the whole thing. I'm just going to tell you, meaning that if you put six grand in two years ago and 6,500, it may not even be worth it to try to parse it out. But either you took a deduction for it and you shouldn't have, or you didn't take a deduction and you've commingled money that shouldn't have been commingled, meaning it's not illegal. It's just that it's a pain in the ass to separate it again. Okay, we can do it. But first question. So number one, how many years, Uncle Joe, did I uh, contribute to the uh, rollover IRA? And did we take a deduction? Okay, got it. That's number one. And then we'll find out what the answer is. And then we can then make a decision. So then next question is from work. Do I have a Roth 401k option? That's your next question. Now, what does your husband have? 
Uh, so he has 107,000 saved in a 401k with his employer, you know, monthly contributions, gets the match from his employer as well. And does he have any other old accounts, either other rollover IRAs or uh, Roth IRAs else that are held with Vanguard as well? No, that's the only one. Okay, great. That's easy then. Do We, we don't know if he has a 401k that's a Roth option, but we should check on that also. I, it sounds like if that's the recommendation for me, it'll probably be the same for him, right? Well, if they have it. If yeah. He, you know, if he I'm pretty place sure. Offers it. I'm pretty sure he does. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So next, how about a brokerage account? Do you have any brokerage account? Yes, we do, but it's relatively small. We have about 38000 in it. Oh, that's not small. That's real not money. You guys have done a great job. You really have. I mean, that's great. Yeah, day to day feels like it just keeps shrinking, but <laughs> no, it's well, good. Good over time. I don't know. Good over time. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, what about what? What would you say is like the the repository for that brokerage account? Like, do you put money in every month? Do you just like when you get a bonus? Like, how does that get funded? So my husband had stock up or, you know, had some RSUs with his company when he joined a couple of years ago. And so they've grown. We don't, it's honestly fun money at this point. It's not like we contribute that much to it, but we buy okay. every now and then with it and just kind of watch it grow. And Right. So when he gets a, when he gets some sort of RSU that is available to sell, he gets it, he sells it, you put it in there, you allocate it into what, exchange traded funds or or do you pick stocks? Like when you say fun money, using it for fun money or investing it as if it were fun money? Investing it, I guess, as if it were fun money. So I mean, it's okay. it, I have a couple stocks, you know, when companies that my friends work at go IPO or, you know, most of it is in like a QQQ or a VTI kind of thing. Okay. Um, so high risk, like I got it. Okay. Not like fun money, like that's our vacation money. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Definitely gotcha. not counting okay. on it. Yeah. So now let's go back. So we've got, you got a whole bunch of money in your 401k, money in your rollover IRA. We need to some get some questions about that. Money in your Roth money in the brokerage, money in your husband's 401k. So all this is great news. You've got a four-year-old and a one-year-old. Have you been investing for them? Do you have 529 plans for them? Yeah, um, we do have 529 plans for them. And we have um, about 8,000 in one and almost 4,000 in the other. And we contribute every month, just a couple hundred to each. We might have grandparent support uh, on college accounts, which is super fortunate. And I think mm. we're going to have about 10000 per year for the next at least few years while my mom and dad are working. So That's great. I know. It's it's incredible. <laughs> so, and then maybe another child we'll see and probably, as you said. And what about um, a home? Do you guys own a house? Yeah. So we own a house. I mean, obviously the bank owns it, but we have a mortgage of about 530000 at 3%. What do you think it's worth? Zillow reports would probably say about <laughs> 730k or somewhere around there. Okay. But you're happy in it. You're going to stay there, right? Yeah. We'll get back to Lisa in just a minute. It's the Jill on Money Show and we'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. Before we went to the break, we were talking to Lisa from New Jersey. What about a cash emergency savings account? What do you got? I guess emergency fund is separate from like our savings fund, but just, mm. I, I don't know, cash accounts all together. We have about, about 50 in checking and then we have a, an emergency fund of about 104,000. Is it bigger or smaller than usual or is this about what you keep? This is about what we keep. I mean, we've, 
you know, obviously buying a home two years ago was pretty big and took a dip in our cash because we were fronting the the down payment. But I think like typically it's pretty normal. Okay, great. What about like your overall, like your cash flow right now? You're putting your 6% and plus other money into IRAs. You're putting a couple hundred bucks into the 529 plans. You know, you're paying off your mortgage. You're doing your fun, fun, you know, fun money investing. Like how is it going for you guys every month? I think it's okay. Income wise, like after taxes and, and 401k contributions, we have about 18,000 per month between the two of us and monthly expenses for like childcare, housing and food and et cetera is probably about 10 or 11,000. Let's call it 11. So you've got seven grand a month extra. Yeah. So I understand. So where has that been going? The $7,000 a month surplus. That just goes that- to our checking account. We kind of figure out what we're going to do with it. Sometimes, you know, if we are going to buy something big or do some work on the house or something, we'll use that checking account for that. But we, it's just been accumulating right now in our checking. Okay. So that's real. It's a real seven. If, even if we said there's an extra five grand a month, like if we said there's two grand a month where it's going into spending or whatever, but there's $5,000 a month that is probably available every month. So yes. why is it that you've limited the amount of money you put into your 401k? Just is it a philosophical reason that you guys only went up to the match? I think it was definitely focused on doing the match. I've since increased beyond the match. I mean, we can definitely afford to do more. Would you recommend that? Yeah, that's that what we, I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah. Use that extra 5K. Yeah, if you're looking at the 5K a month, I think at the very least, what here, I would try to automate things. And you said you want to automate. So Absolutely. once we talk to your uncle about like cleaning the accounts up, ideally, you end up, both you and your husband end up with your traditional 401K at work. And then you also have a, for you, your Roth 401k. And if he can do a Roth, that would be great. He would have a Roth 401k. But what we want you guys to do is put up to the limit of $22,500 a year into your 401ks. And, you know, I know you make a lot of money, which is amazing. Um, You know, you're in the 24% tax bracket. Um, as your highest bracket. But I still think that's worth it for you guys to use the Roth until you start making more money. Maybe if we would change our mind, if you were, you know, making $750,000 together, maybe we would change your mind. But for now, while you're in the 24%, we would make sure that both of you are putting in $22,500 every year into your Roth 401ks. That would be the number one um, recommendation after you get all the details. Then from there, I guess the question is this, you know, you're still going to, maybe you're going to have some extra money, may not be exact, but you know, this is going to be a change for you because the first big change is that you're not going to get your tax deduction, right? But you're not putting that much money in, you know what I mean? Like you're not, you're not actually putting in tons and tons of money into the plan where you're getting this big deduction. But the thing is that if we think about it, we're going to burn up a lot of that cash flow that you have, that extra cash flow of that 7000 a month. Even if we knock it down to 5000 a month, your cash flow is not going to feel as good for you. Right. It's not going to feel like, woo, we got all the money party. Is that OK? Because you're going to have a little less flexibility. Yeah. I mean, I think that's definitely something to be mindful of. And if we um if we plan for it, then I think it's just getting used to the new belt tightening. Yeah. I mean, it's really not belt tightening. It's just like reallocating. So instead of it going into the emergency fund, it's just going into your, you're paying yourself, right? You're making sure you capture this cash flow. And if it's really tight, you know, you can back off a little bit. I guess the other question is, Mark, would you put anything, I mean, we want you to get used to that, but let's say there's an extra thousand dollars a month. Do you think it's worth putting money in the 529 plans or because the grandparents are doing it, should we hold back a little? You said 10000 a year total or per child? Per kid. If that's the case, then no, I would just let them do it and you guys don't have to worry about that for now. Yeah. And then maybe just put that extra money, that surplus money, if you have an extra money, is that maybe start using the brokerage account and using it a little bit more mindfully, meaning... Instead of just saying, I mean, you got plenty of money in cash, right? You've got 150 grand that's sitting in cash. 
unless there's something big coming up that we're missing, I would start making the brokerage account the repository for some extra money and just say, you know, uh, $1,000 a month will go into the brokerage account. And then instead of, you know, QQQ and individual stocks, we'll be a little bit more mindful and we'll say, well, we'll pick a couple of ETFs or a couple of index funds and it's stock market and international, maybe a little bit of a bond fund, and then just be a little bit more directed in that way. By the way, if you are, you'll find out, but if you are still contributing to this traditional IRA, whether it's deductible or whatever, do not contribute to that IRA. Redirect that, you know, that $6,000, $6,500 a year. That should be funneled into your workplace retirement plan. So that may help ease the cash flow problem a little bit. But there's no reason at all you should be using any sort of traditional IRA. Got it. All right. Now, next question. You ready for some more questions by me? Do you guys have life insurance? Uh, We do just through our work and we have kind of the enhanced policy or whatever that comes from our employers, but we don't have... um, so we have term, but we don't have whole life. Or this, you, you shouldn't know. have whole life, but you may want to make sure that you have enough coverage because you guys make a lot of money. And if um, do you have about the same income just split between the two of you? About the same, yeah. Look, if one of you were to pass away and you said, oh, there's uh, $400,000 of coverage through work on each of us, let's just pretend that. I think okay, it's closer fine. to a million or something like that. All right. I would just double check on that. If it's less than a million, I almost would like you to get some more coverage, especially if you're going to have another kid. And what about the estate documents? You got those? We do. We have all those sorted. If you would like to join us on the air live, all you need to do is go to jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here trying to help you make sense of all of your financial options that are ahead of you. If you have a question, all you need to do is go to our website, jillonmoney.com, click the Contact Us button. When you do that, a form will appear, and you know what? Just complete it. We'll do everything else. Right now, let's get to an email from Deborah, whose subject is about life insurance. She writes, my husband received information from an insurance company that a deposit of under $200,000 could earn 4.5%. Now, this is important. It was supposed to be separate from his life insurance and available to withdraw any or all funds at any time with a $25 service fee. The agent confirmed this and the deposit was made. Now we are just finding out they added it to his life insurance policy. They will not refund our money. It's made interest that they want to keep. The only solution they come up for us is to surrender the life insurance policy, accept an amount less than they made than the deposit that was made, or accept my money back and lose my husband's life insurance that he's been paying since 1998. Is this legal? We're getting the runaround from our agent and the higher up people. Can you help, Debbie? Oh, okay. So I think that, first of all, we have to go back and see what, when you say they misrepresented, I wonder if you have anything in writing. That's kind of the key. I mean, the verbal is stinky. And if that happened, I'm very sorry. But if you're getting the runaround, the next step is to basically go up the food chain at the company, and then also go to your state insurance regulator. Insurance is actually regulated state by state. So I don't know where you're from, but that's where they, that's the next place to go to try to get assistance. And again, it may be that it was articulated in a way, but written down differently. So oh, I'm sorry about that. Poor Debbie and her husband just shows you, like, please give us a holler before you sign on the dotted line. Pretty please, pretty please. Okay. This is a question from, let's call this A. Hello, Mark and Jill. 
I've been listening for less than a year, but I feel you already made a big impact on my life. Oh, that's so nice. I've been learning a lot, hearing clear responses, honest advice to real people. Thank you. As many people, I do have questions about my personal situation. I'm an immigrant, came to the U.S. when I was already an adult, got married and then divorced and have a little one that is now seven years old. I'm late to the game because I moved here as an adult. I started from scratch. It's been hard, but I'm making progress. Two questions estate planning. One of my 2023 goals is to have this completed before the end of the year. And yet it's already August and I'm still working on it. Confused. I'm sure it's not that complicated. Wrong. It is complicated. Sorry about that. A, it really is. Every time I hear you talk about estate planning, I assumed you were talking about a trust. And then in one of your episodes, you mentioned a trust wasn't necessary, only a will. And that confused me. Why is a will better than a trust? I'm thinking it depends on the person. Okay. Here is the answer to the question. Estate planning has all these different documents, but there are three essential documents that every single person will want to create. One is a will. A will is the legal document that is the disposition of your assets. And if you are not married, it may be a little bit more important for you to really spend some time on that will because your money is not passing to a spouse by law. In this case, for you, you would also, because you have a seven-year-old, talk about the the person or people that would be taking care of your daughter in the event that something terrible happened to you. So this is very important. That's usually the the real issue with estate planning. People can't figure that out. Who is going to mind my kids after I'm gone? So um, that happens in a will. The other two documents, one is called a healthcare proxy. That assigns someone the right to make a healthcare decision on your behalf if you are unable to do so. And then there is something called a durable power of attorney. That is something that assigns the right to make a business decision if you can't do so. So those are your three. And you should absolutely, especially because you're a little confused about this, instead of just doing this online, it would be important for you to go to a qualified estate planning attorney. A trust is usually necessary when there's a little bit more of a complicating factor, but it may not be that you have a a real complicated life. 45 years old, no family in the U.S., no real estate. I've got a checking and savings account, a high-yield savings account, a 401k, HSA, IRAs, brokerage accounts, CDs, and I-bonds. The follow-up question is a good amount of term life insurance considering your age. It's not so much your age. It's really about what would be necessary to take care of your daughter in the event that you were to pass away. So what I would in- encourage you to do is go to our website under the resources section there is uh, there are a bunch of different headers. One says insurance and one is a life insurance calculator. So check that out because we want to make sure you have the right amount of insurance. So I hope that that helps. Thank you so much for that question. But also all of this stuff is particular to people, but there are some general rules of thumb that we do like to keep you, you know, on the straight and narrow for for like a a solid foundation for your financial life. If you have a financial question, it's just a click away from an answer. Go to jillonmoney.com, click the contact us button. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we conclude the first hour of the program, 
uh, we would like to do a little bit of business, and that business involves telling you about our service, Jill on Money Live. That's where you have access to quarterly live webinars and a lot of cool special bonus content. We recently did a great interview with Chris Gillibo. He is the guy who created Side Hustle School, that awesome podcast. There is so much extra stuff that I want to do that I can't cram into all of our programming. If you want access to that, it will cost you 35 bucks for a whole year, quarterly live webinars, and lots of other bonus content. Check it out. It all lives at jillonmoney.com. Okay, uh, let's do an email. This is from Don who says, as part of an inheritance, I received a collection of silver coins and some paper silver certificates. I'd like to sell the coins. What is the best, easiest way for me to get cash for this collection? Some of the coins date back to the 1890s. Wow, this one's a toughie because I don't know much about the collectible market. So, you know, you have to go online. You have to try to find a reputable dealer in your area. I would definitely do it in person. And I would also make sure that anyone you deal with, you kind of check out, maybe do a little check with your Better Business Bureau or go online and say, you know, scam after the name of the company and uh, go for it, I guess. The the interesting thing is I, I'm wondering if there's any sort of antique nature to your question, in which case you may also want to get somebody who knows something about these older coins. And I don't know anything about that. So that's my best guess for you. Wow, that one kind of was like stump the DJ. That one got me a little bit. If anyone else has some suggestions, maybe you can write into us and we'll hopefully get Don that information. If you've got other questions about something else going on in your financial life, you can always reach us by going to our website, jillonmoney.com. Click the contact us button and we'll do the rest. All right, one whole hour down, another one to go. We'll be right back. the weekend and that can only mean one thing you're listening to jill on money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances here's your host jill schlesinger welcome back it's hour number two of the jill on money show and we we is me jill schlesinger cbs news business analyst and the other person mark talercio he's the executive producer we're both certified financial planners which means that we want to listen to what you tell us and kind of bring it back to what you say you want to do and help you make the best financial decision or maybe even just a better financial decision than the one that you are making right now for yourself so if you need some guidance, if you need some help, we'd love to be there for you. All you need to do is go to our website, jillonmoney.com, click the contact us button. And once you complete the form, you can also let us know if you want to come on the air and Mark does everything else. Now, while you're on the website, there's a lot of free stuff there, like the free weekly newsletter. I think that's a great way to warm up for the uh, for the show, for the weekend show. And you can also buy my book. It's called The Great Money Reset. And to me, this is a book that's kind of the, the outgrowth of conversations that I've had with all of you, uh, people who have gone through big transitions in their lives. So there's nothing better than taking your stories, bringing them to life for everyone else who doesn't even get to listen to the program. So check it out. You can read The Great Money Reset. You can buy it where you buy books or just get it on the website. All right, let's start the second hour with Thomas, who's on the line from San Diego. Basically, my mom is turning 81 soon and she lives alone. Uh, my father passed away earlier this year. Hmm. And my sister and I live in San Diego. My mom lives in LA. And basically, she's lived in that house for probably over 20 years at this point. It's paid off. And she's just been, you know, she's getting older. She's having some health issues. And we've started doing some research into like uh, assisted living communities in our area just to get her closer to us. I mean, it's not a huge distance, but it's just long enough that like 
you know, it, it can be complicated to go as often as we probably need to or we'll start needing to. Mm-hmm. I've always just kind of thought that when she moves, you know, we'd sell her house and then kind of invest the money. My sister's preference quite a bit would be either to sell the house and buy kind of some property among the three of us, like her, me, and my mom, or keep the house and rent it out, either like lease it or do an Airbnb and her kind of thing is like, I would manage the Airbnb. I'd manage the leasing of it just because she rents, um, you know, in Southern California is extremely expensive. And I think it it just makes her nervous not to have any kind of property among the family. Wait, when you say she, it makes her nervous, your sister, not your mom, right? Yeah. My mom getting my mom even to kind of tour assisted living facilities has been kind of a journey Mm, Uh, It's hard. Yeah. And, you know, she's been there for over 20 years. She's really into, like, home and decorating and all that kind of stuff. And she likes her house. But, you know, it's like a big suburban house. And it's hard for her to manage alone. So, yeah. So it has, like, so she's put a deposit. My mom has put a deposit on a a community. But there's a really long wait list, like a year. So we haven't even gone that far. But... I think my mom, without asking her, has always just kind of assumed that she'd sell the house, too. Uh, What's the house worth, would you guess? I would say probably around like 1.2. And tell me about mom's other assets, because there's no mortgage on that. So that's a huge asset. But how is your mom paying to keep this up? Does she have other money? Does she have pension? And just give me a little rundown of her financial situation. Yeah, so I manage her money at this point so i mean i would say between social security and a pension she's bringing in like four thousand a month wow that's good i mean it does take a lot to keep up a 1.2 million dollar home i presume right it's in a it's in a like a gated community so there's like an hoa there's property taxes like gardeners come in once a week house Mm. cleaner comes in once a week that kind of stuff right Um, but does, just, you know. but does she have other money from which she's drawing to pay for her living expenses? Because I presume with everything all in, she's spending more than that $4,000 a month. Is that right? Probably not. Oh, I mean, really? Cause, wow. Because between her living expenses and just home stuff, yep. I don't think she's spending more than 4000 a month. Okay, good. That's great. Tell me yeah. a little bit about like her savings, her investments. What else does she have outstanding? I mean, I would say between IRAs and, and 403B and stuff like that, she probably has around like 1.8. Wow. So what you're telling me is she's pulling money out of these accounts because she's 81. So she has to. She has her minimum required distributions from these accounts. And so presuming that her Social Security and her pension covers her needs, what happens once you're forced to take that money out? Does that just go into a brokerage or savings? Where are you? What are you doing with that right now? Like last year, I started doing her money and I did the RMDs and Mm -hmm. pulled out around probably 40,000. What I've been doing is just kind of moving that money into investments, not in savings, just a savings account. She probably has around forty thousand, mm-hmm. but and I just want that cushion there. Oh yeah, um, definitely. And because of her age, like with me, I'm forty six, so I would just move that stuff into like mutual funds or whatever. But uh, we've been doing just like really safe stuff, so like you know bonds or, or things like that. Typically. So she now has a brokerage account, right? Yeah. And yeah. how much is in the brokerage account? The brokerage account, I would say there's probably like about 600000 Dude, the fact that you're like, you, I thought you were going to say 6000 and now you say 600000 which is humongo. So yeah. you're telling me that your mother's got about $2.4 million total. And yet the Social Security and the pension pretty much cover her needs right now. How much will the assisted living cost? So that's a thing. It's one of those communities where, you know, the size of the unit determines how much a month it costs. Um, So and it also how much you pay is determined on what you put down. If you put down a big chunk of money, it's a lot less a month 
But if you don't put down any money, it's a lot more a month. So let's do it as she does not put down as much money just for the heck of it. How much would it cost monthly? So depending, it would be around like 12 to 14 a month, 12 yeah. to 14 grand a month. OK, if you had to put the most money down, what's the amount down that you would have to put to drive that that um, monthly amount lower? For two bedrooms, the range would be 800000 to 970000 This is such a fascinating story. Do you and your sister have different financial situations? Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. Because I, I, I'm hearing that you're like, you know, you're sort of like a little bit less, it doesn't sound like, it sounds like you're financially secure. Is that right? I mean, you know, who's ever like financially secure? Well, I mean, you I, are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say, you, you know, like, I feel more secure than, than she does, definitely. And this is at least a year away, though, right? I mean, I would say six months to a year. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to Thomas in just a minute. If you would like to figure out how to help your aging parents, if you're trying to help out your adult children, if you're trying to help yourself out, all you need to do is go to our website, jillonmoney.com, click the Contact Us button. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. We're trying to take the mystery out of your financial life. Let's get back to Thomas from San Diego. I am not inclined to want to keep that house. I'm sort of thinking there's, well, there's two things. Is your sister seeking that house as a way for her to be able to have access to the real estate market when she really doesn't right now? I think for her, it's more of like a safety thing. Like if she, say, got evicted or something, she'd have a place to go. And I think it's also a house in Southern California will probably make more money over, say, the course of 10 years than maybe... A bond would. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't know that. And I feel like that's a little bit of your of like timing, you know, and, and yeah. like and guessing and who knows. But here's one thing to consider. Tell me about her health situation. There is a, one reason why I would say that holding the house makes sense, and it is for estate tax purposes. If your mother is in pretty good financial shape, which she is in very good financial shape, she doesn't actually need the proceeds from the house. So there is something to be said for creating some, maybe getting a long-term renter. And I would not Airbnb this thing because I think that's like a recipe for disaster. I would get, a, if you could get a long-term renter in there, that might be good. And what you're preserving then is the ability to make sure that upon your mother's death, that you and your sister receive a step up in cost basis. Because let's say we sold the house right now. What your mom bought it 20 years ago, right? Yep. How much do you think she paid for it? She paid around 500 and this house is held in her name now, right? Because since your father passed away, or is it in some sort of trust? It's in her name. Okay. If she were to sell the house right now, what would happen is that $700,000 of gain would be part of the, you know, just sort of a general gain. She'd get to exclude 250000 of that, but then she would ha have that $450,000 would be long-term capital gains, which she'd have to pay for, versus if she were to pass away owning that home, you guys would inherit that asset as if you paid whatever the fair market value was at the date of death. So there is one reason to actually think about potentially keeping that house, and it's to get the step up in cost basis. That's the only reason that I would have to keep the house, not about an asset play or what's going to gain more. You know, I really don't know that. I really don't know that. Has your mom done estate planning? 
is all this stuff documented in terms of like, you know, her house will pass and this is, will go into an estate and this is how the money is going to be divvied up between you and your sister. Is that all done? Yeah. I mean, if that's done, then now I don't really care. I'm, I'm OK with her keeping the house, and, but I would not I would not get involved in Airbnb. And I probably would be encourage your sister not to be the one responsible for it. I'd hire a property manager. Do you really? I mean, I don't know. Is your sister good at this stuff or not? No. I mean, that's another issue. Right? <laughs> no. She's a potter. She's a cer- ceramicist who's – no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, but no, like neither of us have, you know, our property managers. And it's also – I mean, again, it would be like I wouldn't want to get a call, you know, two in the morning from a runner saying, you know, the plumbing's off or something like right, that. I think, right, I think, Yeah. All right. So what I would say is this. If you're going to have le- – so now let's – big picture. You you first came on the show to say what should we do? Should we sell the house? Not – your mom's in great shape, right? What's going to happen is you're going to accelerate the, I would, if I were you, while your mother's income is still, you know, 22, 24%, I would start pulling more money out of the IRAs, you know, and just pulling some of that money out and get prepared to pay this big fat uh, monthly amount because your four grand a month ain't going to cut it, right? You've got to get more money in cash to prepare for that. I might think about something in between the 800000 down payment and the zero down payment just to maybe get some of your expenses in line. I'd really have to look at what the options were. I mean, you can blow through – you could blow through a lot of money. This twelve to fourteen thousand is this. Does this include meals? Yeah, so it includes things like meals, local transportation, activities, utilities. What it doesn't include, though, which is kind of scary, is if there's more necessary, like personal care. So, mm. like, like you know, help with bathing or help with like eating like so basically it's like an assisted living community but you can age in place but all that is extra so here's what you have to think about with your sister it may be that depending on how the trajectory of your mom's life goes and how healthy she is or is not you may need be forced to sell the house you may need more money you know, she's got a lot of money. I don't I don't want to put this as like, oh, my God, there's something horrible. Right. Because, you know, there's two point four million dollars in investments. So just looking at that, that's going to give you, let's call it 60, 70 grand a year from those investments, hopefully. You know, but if you had to sell the house because she needed more care, it would, your sister has to be prepared for that. So you can say, look, for the time being, depending on mom, when when mom gets in. Sure, let's hold on to the house. But we may be, we may have to sell it and you cannot she can't fight you on that. She's going to have to agree to that up front. Yeah, yeah. Right? No, and I think yeah, yeah. I think we know that. It's just, you know, it's it is difficult cuz you just don't you don't you know. You have an estimate, but yeah, you don't know. You don't know. I mean, I think it sounds like mom is in pretty good shape right now, but I am so convinced when in these situations you cannot get wrap your head around how much that 12 13 14 that like those dollars really escalate fast and you know the other thing is that this facility is this the place like when you said you were on um, you know a bit of a journey is this really the best place for her you know is there some other place that's a little bit more affordable i i don't know but i'm just wondering i'm asking you that aloud We've toured around five places and then showed her three, and this was the only one she liked. And so we're we're working with another placement agency to get some more recommendations. So it's not like this is the only place, obviously, that exists, but just because it's been so difficult to even get her to agree, when she finally did put down to get on the waiting list, it was just like such a relief. But yeah, I mean, it, there are other places, obviously. So, I mean, we, we do want to look at other places that are maybe, you know, not a point system and maybe just to include more things. And this is now and this is towards you guys like this is in San Diego, right? Yeah, it's where we live. And okay. it's, it's, it's maybe like 10, 15 minutes from where we are. You know, it's weird. Like people used to live with their families all the time and they still do. But sometimes the trajectory of your parents aging is such that you really can't take care of them in a way that is feasible. 
you know, that you have to be home full time and that someone's got to be around as the needs increase. And so it sounds to me like that's kind of like where you guys are. So I think you should keep looking. I think that, you know, listen, you, you could potentially hang on to the house for a while. Let's see what you, I mean, I don't know. What do you think it could rent for? You know, I haven't even looked into that. I mean, I I think the, the next step probably would be the, the woman that was their broker who they bought the house from all that time ago. Like they still kind of keep in touch with her. So maybe mm. we could reach out to her and yes. just kind of see – you know, what, what her estimate would be. And I also don't even know because of their community, like, would they even allow things like Ooh. Airbnb or would they allow a long-term runner? So that's something we need to like look into. I would look into that because look, let's just say, let's pretend I'm going to make this up now. Let's pretend that this is a million dollar house. It's in a beautiful place. It's LA. It's desirable. Let's say you can make, I don't know, eight, nine grand a month. And you pay a, you know, you pay a management fee, but like you could clear, maybe you could clear seven grand a month for this thing. In addition to her social security and pension, now we're getting pretty close to meeting her needs. Now that house is generating income, you know, in such a way that you guys may not have to really worry about much. Maybe that's, maybe that's all we need. It's the Jill on Money show. If you'd like to join us, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Let's talk to Brenda, who's on the line from Washington State. Hi, Brenda. How are you? Good morning. I'm fine. Thank you for taking my call. Of course. What can we do for you? What's going on? I, I've been trying to figure out how much longer I need to work. I've done the online. How much do I have? Do I have enough to retire? My initial plans, I'm going to have to work until I'm 70. So I'm just trying to get a good idea. And I don't have anyone managing my money. Uh, it's just sitting in a couple accounts. And I think I need some help. Okay. I like that nobody's managing your money. You're managing your money. So that seems good. How old are you, Brenda? I am 65. And you're still working full time? Still working full time. And uh, how much do you earn right now? About 82000 a year. Is that enough for you to live on? Do you feel comfortable at that? I, know, I'm kinda li- I feel like I'm living paycheck to paycheck with how much, I, with how much right now. I keep hoping Is- I'll, my job title will change. I'll do something a little different and, and get a little bit higher salary. But for now, you're not going into debt on no. this. Uh, okay. Um, and are you entitled to a pension when you retire? I do not have a pension. No pension. Okay, not a problem. So tell us about what you've done in terms of savings so far. So I, uh, let's see, I have a brokerage account, an E-Trade brokerage account, and I have an IRA. In the IRA, I have about $820,000, $246,000 of that is cash. And I was using that as kind of a hedge because all my stocks I have are aggressive kind of growth stocks. I don't have any okay. bonds or anything. Then I have my straight brokerage account is six hundred and eighty three thousand dollars. I yeah. have a, a Janus IRA that's fifty two thousand. And, and that so that basically the Janus is held separately yes. from your IRA. Okay. Yes. Um, where is the brokerage account and the IRA held right now? The big account. E Trade. Okay, that's I thought I knew you said that. Okay, great. So you've got 683, 820, no bonds, the Janus Mutual Fund, and that's also an IRA. And uh, do you have a current IRA, um, I'm sorry, a current retirement account that you're um, contributing from the 82000 So I have a small, uh, I'm not contributing to it. I've got about $14,000 mm-hmm. in a work, a work plan. I was contributing a little bit for a while they automatically contribute three percent of my salary uh and then there's an option for me to get an extra 
2% if I contribute 8%. I was doing that for a while, but I had to buy a new car and I had some condo overruns that were unexpected in my remodel. Uh, okay. So I stopped contributing, but I got about 14000 in that plan. Okay, and you got a condo. How much is that worth? It's worth about, uh, I'd say about 700 maybe 720 Do you have a mortgage that's outstanding on it? Uh, I paid cash for that from a home that I had sold, and I took out a six. I took out an eighty thousand home equity loan, not a line of credit, just a home equity loan for the remodel, Uh, and that's Uh there's about sixty thousand left on that, and it's three percent interest rate. Wow, three percent fixed? Yes. Oh my God, that's great. Huge. Uh, What about just cash on hand? That's the hard part. I I only have about forty, probably about forty five, forty six thousand right now. I my condo remodel was about fifty thousand more than expected, Mm -hmm. and then my Mm -hmm. old car died, and I had to buy a new used car a couple years ago in the height of the whole used car price hike. So I paid cat. I paid like twenty seven cash for that. So right now, all right, don't don't freak. That's that's fine. That's okay. If you look at just your cost of living your life, like Brenda's best life, not living hand to mouth, but like, what do you think is the amount of money you need to live on and be happy, not worrying? Uh, probably, I I say eighty five, something like that. Right now, you receive benefits through work, so you're still working. Yes. And is there anything about your workplace that would give you benefits in retirement, whether it's health care or anything else like no. that? No, I don't okay. have to do that. Oh, one what? thing, I do have dividends. I get about 13000 I don't have the dividends reinvested, so that's an additional probably about thirteen k a year on top of my salary. Okay, thirteen k a a year dividends. Okay. So that's helping you with the other stuff. That's how you have your nice little, your little, um, you know, like your base there. You you have a little bit extra that's coming in. All right. So what would be your Social Security benefit if you retired at your full retirement age, which I presume is like within the next couple of years? So what's your full retirement age Social Security? I looked that up and I think it's about 1800 if I retired at 66 and a half. Okay, and do you happen to know what the the what it is at age seventy? I think it's like twenty one, two thousand twenty one hundred something like that. I looked a okay. months ago. How is working for you? Is it does it is it horrible? Do you hate it? No. Like, what do you no, think? No, I don't hate it. Uh, okay, I I enjoy what I do. Uh, I'm in healthcare, and I feel like it's uh, what I do is kind of giving back to giving back to the community in a way in the, in the role that I play. So I do, enjoy, I do enjoy that very much. So if I said to you, uh, work till 70, it's better. Are you going to freak or do you feel okay about that? I'd rather not have to work. I'd rather not work till 70 if I don't have to. But you're okay, 66 and a half. Let's just say 67. So okay. you're 65. What, so two more years. You can right. feel good about two more years? I think I could feel good about two more years. So right now, there's an interesting situation, which is, You're not in a high tax bracket, first of all. So, you know, there is something to be said. Instead of pulling the dividends of 13 grand a year, I kind of wouldn't mind those dividends being reinvested right now and start to slowly pull money out of your retirement accounts. Because I'm, listen, when when you turn 75, there's going to be a pretty you know, a a chunky distribution that you're going to have to take, your minimum required distribution. The thing is, let's say she stops working when she's 67, okay? And there's $900,000 in retirement accounts, about, you know, between the Janus, your IRA, and your work plan, okay? There'll be about $900,000. So what would be kind of interesting for us would be like, hey, Maybe what you should do is pull out, you know, 85 grand in your, you know, from that account. You'll pay your 22% tax. You're in Washington state, no state income tax. And you live on that for three years and see how things go. It's Jill on Money. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we need to conclude our conversation with Brenda from Washington State. You said 85000 I have a feeling that it's not quite 85000 but let's pretend it, we, it were. So of your $7,000 a month, you will have 2100 that is, you know, available from Social Security, and then you need another five grand a month. So you'll need $60,000 that comes from some combination of your IRA accounts, which remember at age 70, it's going to be it's going to be reduced, right? Because we're pulling money out for those 60, right? 67, 68, 60. So those three years where, you know, all of a sudden you're not going to have 900, you're going to have 600 or so. I'm, I'm making up these numbers. This is a back of the envelope calculation. And then you'll still have your brokerage account, which hopefully will be worth around 700,000. So you'll have $1.3 million about, about, okay? I'm giving you again, the abouts. So if I had $1.3 million and I wanted to be safe, I would say, I ah, pull 40 grand out of that from your, you know, 40-ish from those accounts, pay whatever taxes do from the retirement accounts, and then we get thirty two fifty a month, about, okay? So it's not quite 85000 but it's, uh, you know, you're going to get to uh, five 6000 if you want to spend $85,000 a year net to you going forward, you got to work longer than 67. That's what I can tell you right now. That's that's your deal. You want to live on 60 grand a year, you're going to be fine retiring at 67. If you want 85, you got to work to your 70. But I I it's find it hard to believe you're living on 85 grand right now because you know, you make 82. I know that you're spending some of that dividend money from the account. But I don't know, like, I think part of it is me. kids, weddings, grandbabies. <laughs> well, stop. Th- OK, wait a minute. So we didn't talk about that. So that's different. Those things you actually cannot afford to do. OK, so you ha- the weddings are we don't you have adult children, I've got right? One, I've got one more uh, wedding coming up. Well, you certainly how much are you going to spend on that? I don't know yet. I haven't. They just got engaged, so I'm not sure. How much did you spend on the first one? Probably about probably about eight or nine. I mean, that's about all you can spend. You should not be putting money into any sort of like college fund for yeah, grandkids. Yeah, there's not. like there's no help for you. Like in terms of my re, like my my thought process on this, and I think Mark would agree, is that you've done a great job, fantastic job saving for yourself. Really great. But you don't have so much money that unless you're willing to work till you're 72, that you should be giving money away to kids and grandkids. That cannot happen right now. Right. Got that. And plus, I worry about investments on my condo, which is one reason why I'm keeping the dividends in case I have a big assessment because I live in a pretty old building and and there's going to be future assessments. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And like having money, certainly having money on hand is amazing and you should and you should have a safety net for sure. But, you know, I don't think I think your solution is more much more within your grasp than you probably realize in that it is going to be your choice about when you retire And that is predicated on how much money you are willing to spend in retirement. But, you know, I think that as always with these questions, the longer you work, the better this looks. I'm sorry to say that because like, it's sort of like, oh, you're such a buzzkill, Jill. I I get that I am. This, This is buzzkill Jill today. But I don't know, like there's only so much money and you've done a real, like I said, you've done a really good job accumulating assets, but- I think we have to be thoughtful about the when, because it's really hard to get back into the workforce once you leave it. Brenda, have you done your estate planning? I have not. Oh, hello. (laughs) Where did you think that, that, where is that brokerage account money going? I do have a will. I need to put, I think I need to put my condo into trust. You don't have to. I don't have to. No, you don't. So estate planning, yes. I mean, everything's in my, my two kids. Yeah. Listed as beneficiaries. 
fine. That's fine. But they have to. But it's it just make sure that you update the will to reflect. For example, you got one kid who has grandkids, right? Yes. So you're going to have to have a little like there's something in the will that's going to have to say like, hey, if God forbid my kid dies before me, her. Is it a her? Yes. Her or his. Her share will go to her grandkid to, to your grandkids like it skips over the spouse okay and you can make it very specific like my money goes to my adult children not their spouses god forbid we don't know these are young kids who knows what's going to happen in their marriages got it okay yeah, you know what i mean that. you should actually just go to your estate attorney did you have one or did you do it uh, i had one when i we had one where we were married my ex-husband and then a, uh-huh. i had someone update it uh, when we divorced. Oh, good. That person who updated it should update it with to reflect your adult children. Make sure everything's perfect. Hey, does your ex-husband, um, is is he older or younger than you? About the same age. And I think I, I don't think my, I don't think his half of Social Security is greater than my Social Security. Oh, that, you knew where I was going. You knew I was going for that. I was going hard in on that. Oh, I want that Social Security. Okay. I think you're in great shape. I'm glad you like what you do. And as I said, if you are willing to work longer, all of those pieces will come together much more um, seamlessly. If you'd like to join us, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. Jill on Money will be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we conclude the program, let's do an email. This is from Karen, who writes, I own two homes with $360,000 in equity and $300,000 in mortgages between the two. I really want my kids to have the benefit of equity. Is it too soon to put these properties in irrevocable trusts? You know what? I don't love this idea, Karen irrevocable. You know what that means? It means not changeable. You don't mention your age and you don't mention any other assets. So it's hard for me to weigh in on you making a a decision this big that you can't change without knowing a lot more about you. I would really, really love for you to get back in touch with us. Give us a holler, especially when it comes to real estate. Sometimes the idea of moving assets around, not the greatest thing in the world when it comes to longer term estate planning. So really would love to hear more from you. And for anyone else who's contemplating one of these big changes, at least when it comes to real estate, you've got to be thoughtful. You don't want to create a tax mess for your kids. You don't want to create a problem for yourself. So all of this should be a lengthier process, part of a larger financial and estate plan. And if we can help you on that road to get the right professionals to help you out, Karen, well, we'd love to do that. So get back in touch with us, okay? Well, that's it. That is the program. It's gone by so fast. I want to make sure that we uh, wish our Jewish listeners a happy new year. I am recording this in advance. Don't worry. I am not working on Russia. Shoshana. So happy new year to our Jewish listeners and to everyone else. Want to remind you that our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Delercio is our executive producer and our web king. And we like to encourage you to do something nice for someone else today. It's going to make that person feel good. It's going to make you feel really good. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next week. <music>